Chapter 81 Chapter 78 The Crack Widens That night after my little chat with Padme, nothing really happened for the next week. Then came the reconciliation ceremony between the humans of Naboo and the Gungan. A celebration the film truly failed to capture the size and scope of. The event led to the entire planet basically partying for an entire day non-stop. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. Then once it did, it basically came time for all parties to head back where they came from. Sitting in the conference room of the Milano, I conversed with a life-sized hologram of Cole. Him and the others members of Dominicus, who assisted me in fighting the Trade Federation on Naboo, having left almost immediately after the occupation ended. Which was my decision, for I didn't want any of them around Palpatine, nor the Jedi High Council. Since both factions would ask too many questions, and I didn't want to risk my connection to Dominicus getting exposed just yet. So I sent them packing. So, you're on your way back? Cole asked me after having given me a status report on Dominicus as a whole, for he is my number two within the group. Yep, I replied. I'll also be bringing some guests back with me, I told him. The boy Anakin and his mother Shimi, that astromech droid R2-D2, the droid 3PO, and the Jedi Master Jin, I explained, Padme having gifted R2 to Anakin on my request. For you can't have C-3PO without R2-D2, that's like not without day, plus the little astromech droid has grown on me so there was no way I was leaving him behind. I see. Anything else I should know? Cole asked me. Yeah, HK-47 will be heading back on his own with a very special package we managed to get our hands on, I said. Not getting into any specific details, on the off chance someone was listening to mine and Cole's communication. Constant vigilance. Good to know. See you soon, he told me. The same to you, my friend, I replied. We then ended the hollow call. Once we did, I left the conference room and headed to my personal quarters to check my personal messages on my personal terminal. For the same day I resigned from the Jedi Order, I sent out a broad message informing Yanali, my closest friends and allies, and pretty much all members of the coalition of my decision. Since I didn't want them to hear about it from anyone but me. Looking through the messages, I was surprised namely by the lack of shock in the responses I received from the message I sent out informing people of my resignation from the Order. I mean, I expected such reactions from my closest friends and allies, but what I didn't expect was the lack of surprise from the members of the Coalition at my choice. It almost seemed like everyone had expected I would leave the Jedi Order. But that couldn't be, right? Deciding to get a second opinion on the matter, I contacted Yanali and then explained my thoughts to her. Oh yeah, everyone expected you to leave the order sooner or later, Yanali told me. Really? I asked. Am I that easy to read? I questioned. No, not at all. In fact, sometimes I still can't even read you. But given me, our friends, and the members of the coalition were around you for years and observed your actions and knew your opinions on certain matters, then it wasn't a big leap for them to make in logic that you would do something along the lines of going against the order entirely one day. Yanali explained to me. TC, I replied. Thanks for that. No problem, Yanali said. So, I need you to come back to Coruscant and pick me up, she said. Sure, I replied. You're not even going to ask why. Yanali questioned me. Tan, take a guess, I told her. Plus, there's still the Sarah thing. And given what you're planning and that I have resigned from the Order, this might be the only chance for all three of us to be together for a while. So yeah, I'll head back to Coruscant. Thanks, Yanali replied. Well then see you soon. Love you. Love you too, I said. We then ended our call. Me leaning back in my chair, oh, after I did. Running a hand through my shoulder-length hair, I inhaled and then exhaled. My thoughts going towards the coming talk between Sarah, Yanali, and I. Hoping that things wouldn't get too awkward or drama-filled. I was knocked out of my thoughts by HK-47 contacting me over the ship's comms. Statement, Master, the Jedi meatbag called Obi-Wan is outside the ship and requesting a meeting with you, HK-47 stated. Hearing this, I got up and headed outside the ship to meet with Obi-Wan. Hello there, Obi-Wan, I said to him. Oh yes, hello there, Van, Obi-Wan, finally saying the thing. Me hearing it coming out of his mouth, everything I dreamed it would be, but then again, it is his catchphrase, so of course it hits different when he speak it. 
So what do you need, my friend? I asked him. They've come to tell you my decision about the offer you made me on the day you and Qui-Gon resigned from the Order, Obi-Wan explained. I see, so you have finally decided, I asked. Yes, I have, Obi-Wan replied. And what is your decision? I questioned. They've decided to join you, Obi-Wan said. I've already informed the Council of my decision and turned over my lightsaber, he explained. It wasn't easy, but if I can still keep following the principal tenets of the Jedi and be with Satine, then I am ready to try, he spoke, his words bringing a smile to my face. You're making the right choice, my friend. I promise you that, I said. To do hope I am, Obi-Wan replied. Once he did so, I brought him aboard the Milano and gave him his own room. I then went and informed the others of his decision. Qui-Gon being the happiest of the bunch when I did. Makes sense, since he and Obi-Wan are basically father and son. After telling everyone I headed to the cockpit, I then sent HK-47 off to collect the scimitar. Then once he retrieved it and told me he was safely off-planet, I took off in the Milano. Heading into space I watched as the scimitar jumped into hyperspace. Then once it did, I initiated my own hyperspace jump in the Milano. On my way back to Coruscant for what would likely be a while. Woody Temple, Coruscant, Galactic City Standing before the Jedi High Council, within their meeting room, within the temple on Coruscant, Yanali had a calm expression on her face and felt at peace. A stark contrast to the High Council, some of whom were looking at Yanali with disapproval marrying their faces, while others had neutral expressions. Finally there was her master Plo Koon, who looked stoic but inside was deeply worried for his apprentice. For the meeting she was currently having with the High Council would determine her future with the Jedi Order. Begin the meeting let us, Yoda spoke. Padawan learner, Yanali Phonimus, you stand before the High Council today for your taking of actions that go against the Jedi Order's code, specifically the rules related to attachment, Windu spoke. From statements we have received from various members of the Order here at the Temple over these past few days, it seems you have been alluding to an intimate relationship with the former Jedi Knight Van Sunrider. What do you have to say for yourself? It's absolutely true. Yanali easily replied, shocking the entire council. Ignoring the council's shocked expression, Yanali removed her lightsaber from her hip and then used her telekinesis to place it on Plo Koon's lap. Once she did this, Yanali a kind smile to her master before looking at the rest of the High Council again, who seemed to have finally regained their composure. Padawan learner Phonimus, you do understand what your actions mean, do you not? Master Mundi asked her. Yes, I understand perfectly, Yanali replied. Oh, and before you all say anything else, I just want to say I am officially resigning from the Jedi Order. She spoke, once again shocking the High Council. Are you serious, Padawan Phonimus? Master Peel asked her. Yes, Yanali replied. Since the Order will not allow Van and us to remain together, I cannot remain a part of it. She explained. So former Knight Sunrider put you up to this, did he? Teen asked Yanali who looked at him like he was an idiot. No, he did not. I made this decision on my own, Yanali explained, namely because I have Van and he loves me. But due to the Order's rules, and this council being too scared and stubborn to allow for something new, the two of us are going our own way. Anyway, thanks for everything. Bye, she said. Yanali then left the High Council room, ignoring the calls of Mace Windu telling her to stop. To think two of our members with such great potential would fall so far. Mundi spoke, but before he could say another word, Plo Koon spoke up. Mundi, be very careful the next words you speak out of your mouth, the Keldor Jedi Master said, giving Mundi a harsh glare as he did. Or did you forget about your own wives and children? Plo Koon asked. This caused Mundi to start glaring harshly at Plo Koon. The two continued glaring at each other for a few seconds before Windu spoke up. That is enough, Windu said. What has happened has happened. Yes, what has happened in that just a short span of time the Order has lost a respected master, a powerful young knight, and two promising young Padawans. Adi Gallia. Or am I missing something? She rhetorically asked. This caused the High Council members to start debating with each other again, the situation ending up exactly like it did when Van, Quigon, and Obi-Wan left the Order on Naboo. Ignoring the council's bickering, Plo Koon got up from his seat and went to chase after Yanali. Yoda allowing it, 
while he worked to calm down the rest of the High Council. The Keldor Jedi Master caught up to his apprentice, just as she was about to leave the Jedi Temple. Yenali, Plo Koon spoke, which caused Yenali to stop in her tracks and turn to face him. Master Plo, she said. Yenali, no little Nali, so you are in love with young Sunrider? He asked. Tam Master, Yenali replied. I apologize for not telling you until now, but I knew you would have tried to put a stop to it, and even if you hadn't with you being on the High Council, it would have put you in an awkward position, and I couldn't do that to you. Not when you've given me so much over the years, which I truly appreciate, but I can't stay with the Order, not when it makes us try and give up the things that allow us to connect to others. Emotions, relationships, etc. I struggled with the feelings I have for Van for a long time, and now that I know the true depth of my feelings, I can't go back to locking them away, she spoke. Once more, thank you for all you've done for me, and if the day comes when you wish to follow in my footsteps and leave the order, then I'll be waiting, Yanali said. Then having nothing left to say, she exited the Jedi Temple, leaving Plo Koon standing there, alone with his thoughts and the words Yanali just spoke to him. The Keldor Jedi for the first time in a long time having no idea how to handle the situation he was facing. And Plo Koon was not the only one. Upon learning of Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, Van, and Yanali, leaving the Order and the reasons behind their departures, two sides began to form within the Jedi Order's ranks. Those who were firmly against the resigned group's actions, and those who tried to understand them. Then there was a small number within the Jedi Order who even agreed with them. Thus the crack of the burgeoning schism within the Jedi Order widened. A.N. Yes, the schism within the Order grows. Chapter 82, Chapter 79, Expulsion and Resignations, Person Standing before the Jedi High Council, Sifo Dias was looked at with shock, disappointment, and even a little bit of anger. Why? For he had just informed the Jedi High Council of his actions in commissioning a clone army for the Republic from the Kaminoans. Having been away for the past few months, first handling a mission for the Jedi High Council, in acting as a negotiator between several jungle tribes on Felucia, and then completing secret negotiations between the Pike Syndicate and the Republic government on the moon of Obadiah, assigned to him by the recently retired Supreme Chancellor, Finis Valorum, Sifo Dias had been unaware of the events taking place in the Jedi Order. It wasn't until he returned to Coruscant and had a chance to speak with Marcellus that he learned of Van and the other's resignation from the Jedi Order, as well as the Sith, Maul, who Van defeated on Naboo. When Sifo Dias did, he was at a loss for words. He also felt a new sense of dread, namely because of the return of the Sith. For never before had Sifo Dias considered his constant vision of darkness engulfing the galaxy could relate to the Sith because no one had seen them in close to 1,000 years. But the more Sifo Dias thought about it, the more he realized how foolish he had been not to think his vision was warning him about the Sith. For Sifo Dias was a student of history, and recalling the Jedi records he knew, the Sith time and time and again were thought extinct, and yet came back to threaten the galaxy time and time again. Upon this realization, Sifo Dias decided he needed to help and prepare the galaxy for the return of the Sith, which is why he had requested a meeting with the High Council and had revealed his actions involving the Kaminoans so he could do just that. Now here Sifo Dias is. Master Sifo Dias, do you have any idea the position you've placed this council in? Master Teen asked. Your actions not only violated the very rules of this order, but the laws of the Republic itself, Mundi spoke. So. What say you? Take full responsibility for my actions, but do not apologize for them, Sifo Dias stated. For I did what I felt was necessary to combat the coming darkness, a darkness I have been telling this council and the order about for years, and yet all of you have dismissed me. Yet just a short while ago we learned our age-old enemy, the Sith were not as extinct as we thought. Maybe they never were. Maybe. Just like many times before over the millennia, the Sith went into hiding and have been slowing building up their strength to attack us and the Republic, and if they did so right now, neither the Order nor the Republic would stand a chance. So yes, I violated the rules of this Order, and yes I violated the Republic's laws, the Rus and Reformations, 
but I would do it again in a heartbeat if it meant ensuring the lives of countless beings and their futures, along with keeping the galaxy from sinking into the abyss. He spoke passionately. While that speech was admirable, the fact remains, you still violated this order's rules and the Rusin Reformation set forth by the Republic. As such, this council has no other choice but to exile you from the Jedi Order. Mace Windu spoke. Your lightsaber, he said. Once he did, Sifo Dias removed his lightsaber from his belt, walked up to Windu, and placed it in his hand. He then left the High Council meeting room, coming face to face with Dooku and Marcellus after he did, both of whom were wearing angry expressions on their faces. Because Sifo Dias had informed them both of the actions he had taken on Kamino before going to face the High Council. Master, what were you thinking? Marcellus asked angrily. Of all the idiotic things you could have done, why didn't you tell anyone, or consult anyone, before taking such actions? T couldn't risk you all getting punished alongside me, Sifo Dias replied. I made this decision on my own and shall suffer the consequences on my own, he explained. Ugh, you stub, born old fool, Marcellus exclaimed. This is why we formed the coalition in the first place, so you wouldn't have to do things like this alone. Tam inclined to agree with young knight Antilles, my old friend, Dooku said. You took these actions, commissioned this army, without even asking our opinions on the matter. You have been dismissed by the council concerning your visions for years, and now it seems you have become like them. No, I am nothing like them. Sifo Dias retorted. If that was the case, you would have not dismissed us in the coalition when you commissioned this clone army from Kamino, Dooku said. Don't you get it? I'm trying to save you all, Sifo Dias exclaimed. I will not stand by and watch as you both and everyone else is swallowed up by the coming darkness. I refuse to, so I will do what I must to prevent that, he explained. Dooku and Marcellus sensing immense fear and anxiety from Sifo Dias, getting a better idea of where he was coming from. He had been dealing with the vision of darkness enshrouding the galaxy for years, having hardly anyone listen to his warnings sometimes being ignored entirely. It would mess with anyone's mental state, even a Jedi's. Dooku and Marcellus came to understand this, but it didn't mean they would simply forgive Sifo Dias. No, it would take time before they did, but they definitely would. T feel your reasons behind your actions, old friend, and I understand why you took them, but you still should have consulted the Coalition first, Dooku said. Yeah, what Master Dooku said, Marcellus added. You're both right, I should have. Sifo Dias admitted, It seems I was becoming the High Council without even realizing it. For that I am truly sorry, he said. Good, now don't do it again, Marcellus spoke, Dooku simply nodding his head in agreement. Yes, I'll try, Sifo Dias said. Excellent. Now then, excuse me, Dooku said. He then walked past Sifo Dias, Marcellus trailing right behind him. The pair soon entered the High Council room, drawing the attention of all the High Council members after they did. Knight Antilles and Master Dooku, what is the meaning of this? Master Poof asked. This, Marcellus said, removing his lightsaber from his belt and taking it over to Master Poof. I resign from the Jedi Order. Bye, he said. Marcellus then strutted out of the High Council room. Once he was gone, Dooku removed his own lightsaber from his belt and used his telekinesis to place it on the ground in front of Yoda. Resign from the order you do, Dooku? Yoda asked. Yes, Dooku easily replied. I can no longer serve this body, who allows corruption to flourish right before their eyes. Who allows innocent people to suffer when there is proof that they are? Who would expel my friend for simply doing what this council seems to no longer be able to do, taking steps to protect the innocent? He spoke with righteousness. I will not stand for it any longer, Dooku exclaimed. Now we know where your former apprentices got their attitudes from, Mundi said. Yes, and I couldn't be more proud to call myself their teacher. Dooku replied smoothly to Mundi. Now I shall take my leave. Good day, masters, he mused. Dooku then left the High Council room, his cape flowing behind him in the process, leaving the High Council alone once again, the schism in the Order having grown even more. Chapter 83 Chapter 80 Menage Troy Van Personal Apartment, Coruscant, Galactic City. Sitting on the couch in my apartment, I watched as a torrential rainstorm poured down outside, which is pretty apt, 
considering what a shitstorm the last few days have been. First, Yanali resigned from the order. Second, Sifo Dias revealed the existence of the goddamn clone army he commissioned on Kamino to the Jedi High Council, and in turn got his ass exiled from the Jedi Order. Then, there's Marcellus and Dooku, who both resigned from the Jedi Order the same day Sifo Dias's whole situation went down. It was a lot to process. I mean, I knew the Yanali and Dooku resignations were coming, but still. My mind was overwhelmed with all taking place basically all at the same time especially the sifo Dias thing. That came as the biggest fucking shock. I thought I had changed the future enough so that sifo Dias wouldn't commission the clone army, but it looks like the butterfly effects I created weren't strong enough to prevent him from taking that particular course of action. Well, at least that situation turned out better than in the original story. sifo Dias isn't dead, and now both the Jedi High Council and the Republic who I got confirmation from from the members on the High Council who are a part of our coalition, are aware of the existence of the Clone Army a decade before the Clone Wars are supposed to take place. Though I have yet to see if that change is a good thing or a bad thing. Only time will tell. Oh, and then there's Marcellus resigning from the Order. I mean, I was going to ask him to do so and join us, but I didn't expect him to take action this early. Still, I'm glad. Now, the two of us can criff stuff up all over the galaxy without hardly any restrictions on either of us. I can't wait until we start. As I was contemplating my future galaxy-spanning adventures with my best friend, I was knocked out of my thoughts as the door to my apartment opened. Turning in the direction of the door, I saw it was Sarah who entered. Since tonight is the night Yanali and I have decided to discuss with Sarah her feelings about me. A conversation, which I am once again hoping doesn't end in a total Klesuter criff. As Sarah closed and locked my apartment door, I noticed she was soaking wet. Her clothes sticking to her body so tightly, I could it out without any trouble. So noticing this, I did the gentlemanly thing. I went to go get Sarah a towel for her dry herself off with, after taking several snapshots of her with my eyes and saving the images in my mind for later. Which I don't regret. Coming back, I went up to Sarah and gave her the towel. Here you are, I said. Thanks, Van, Sarah said, taking the towel and beginning to dry off. Oh, Sarah, you're here, Yanali said, coming out of my bedroom. Good, she said. Yanali then moved to sit down on the couch. I then joined her. Then after Sarah finished drying off, she sat down in the chair situated next to the couch. So, why did you guys call me out here? She asked. You know the temple wasn't easy to sneak out of, given the effect your guy's actions have caused on the Order as a whole, she explained. Telling us how two prominent factions have formed in the Jedi Order due to our resignations and the resignations of the others. The first camp belonged to the, the Traditionalist, which were made up of many older knights and masters, who were basically disgusted by the reasons Yenali, the others, and I left the Order while the second belonged to those with more open minds, which were made up of Padawans, several knights, and even several masters who somewhat understood and even agreed with the reasons the others and I left the order. Sarah explained to all to us. So, the schism has begun, I thought, telling me now more than ever I must press forward, not just for me, but for those within the order that support my action in resigning from it. I want to pave the way for them to do the same, if they so choose. Meaning, yet another thing has been added to M, I to-do list, but one that I have no problem completing, unlike some others. Moving on. Thank you for letting us know the situation in the Order Sarah, I told her. Yes, thank you, Yanali added. Now as to the reason Van and I called you to his apartment tonight, it's because this might be the last time the both of us will on Coruscant for a long time, and before we left, we wanted to discuss your romantic feelings for him, she spoke, just ripping the proverbial band-aid. Hearing Yanali's words, Sarah got a scared expression on her face. She then stood out of the chair and backed up. No, it's not what you think, okay? She hastily spoke. I don't want to come between you so you have nothing to worry about, nothing at all. I swear it, Sarah told us, her panic growing as she did. Talso sensed immense amounts of shame starting to well up inside of her. Sarah, please calm down, I asked her. We're not angry with you, I told her. You, you're not? She asked. No, we're not, 
I replied. Like I've been saying for years, feelings are often things you can't truly control. You like me, but I know you didn't start doing it on purpose. These feelings just sprung up in you one day. So there is nothing to be scared or ashamed of, I explained to her. Once again, remembering the oh-so-joyous task I will have in the future of teaching any members from the current order who join my new one how to properly express their emotions, instead of suppressing them. Boy, what fun that will be. Not. Van is exactly right, Sarah, Yanali added. Feelings are nothing to be ashamed of. Oh, okay, Sarah shakily said. She then slowly but surely returned to the chair and sat back down. Thank you, I said to her. Yes, thank you, Sarah, Yanali added. Right, Sarah spoke. So, um, what's next? She asked hesitantly. Well, you like Van as a man, right? Yanali asked. L, I do, Sarah admitted softly. And I've been trying to get the feelings to go away, but no matter what I do, they won't. She confessed. Sorry. Once again, there is nothing for you to be sorry about. Yanali spoke. Especially since I don't mind you exploring your feelings for Van. She revealed. Am Yanali, exactly what are you saying? I asked her just for clarification. Because if what I'm thinking is right, then it shows me there are still a few things about Yenali I have absolutely no idea about. Instead of answering me, Yenali gave me a smirk. A moment after she did, I suddenly saw images in my mind she sent me through our force bond. Showcasing me, her, and Sarah in risque and rather hot situations. Seeing this confirmed my suspicions. Yenali is giving me permission to be with Sarah, and has no issues being in a polyamorous relationship. To say I didn't see this coming would be an understatement. But it is not an unwelcome development. I mean, I'm not saying I'm looking to create a harem or be with more than one woman, but if Yanali is giving me permission, and if Sarah is willing to try, then I see no reason why I should not also try. So yeah, multiple partners it is. Accepting this, I suddenly recalled that dark side future version of myself I saw on Ilum all those years ago during the gathering, wondering how much of that particular future would still come to pass. Namely, me and Isla getting together. But I can ponder that later. Right now I need to focus on the two women in front of me. Moving over to Sarah, I pulled her into a tender hug. Van, what are you doing? She asked, getting a massive blush. Oh, me and Yanali just had a mental conversation, and she just said she doesn't mind if you join our relationship. If you're willing, that is. I spoke. What? Sarah exclaimed in complete surprise. She then looked at her best friend. Yanali, are you truly all right with it? I mean, don't you love Van? To do, Yanali immediately replied. But I also love you, and who says love only needs to be between two people? All right, Sarah replied. So what do you say, Sarah? I asked her. Not saying a word, she leaned forward and gave me a quick kiss, telling me all I needed to know. She's in meaning now I am dating both her and Yanali. Boy, what a night this has been. The following day, I found myself mulling over some food. Yanali, Sarah, and I having spent the night together. But we weren't having sex. We were just simply talking about how our new relationship would work, especially since Sarah was still a member of the Order. After a long discussion, we three agreed Sarah would too leave the Order and come along with us, which she is doing right now. Meanwhile, Yanali is out shopping for supplies and whatnot. While I am in my apartment, still processing the fact I am now dating two women at the same time. Two beautiful, sexy, hot women. Damn. I'm lucky, I said. Just as I did, so the door I heard the beeping of my mini holo projector. Using my telekinesis, I brought it over to myself and answered it. Seeing a mini hologram of HK-47 after I did. Statement. Greetings, master, he said. Hey, HK, I replied. Query, so how did it go with the female Jedi meatbag Sarah last night? Did you crush her feelings of love and lust towards you? HK-47 asked, since I told him about Sarah's feelings for me, for he was the only one I could talk to about it who would be brutally honest with me concerning them. No, I didn't. In fact, Sarah has entered a relationship with Yanali and I, I explained. Statement, I see. So just like my creator, you are now exchanging bodily fluids with two female meatbags, HK-47 said. Yeah, hey, wait, I spoke. Riven had another lover besides Bastila, who, I asked. Answer, the female Jedi meatbag Mitra Surik. HK-47, blowing my mind. You're kidding, I said. Statement, I am not, HK-47 replied. Explanation, before my master lost his memories and ended up bonding with the female Jedi meatbag known as Bastila, 
he would regularly exchange bodily fluids with the female Jedi meatbag, Mitra Surik. In fact, even after choosing Bastila as his mate, he still exchanged bodily fluids with the female meatbag, Mitra Surik. My creator sometimes exchanged bodily fluids with both female Jedi meatbags at the same time. HK-47 spoke, revealing a side to Raven, Mitra Surik, and Bastila Shan I never knew existed. I mean I knew Mitra and Raven were close, but not that close. All one can say is damn, Raven's Riz energy must have been extremely high. Respect. A.N. Another chapter done. Like I said, this will be a harem story, but not a super easy relationship mashup. What I mean is I want to write a harem with substance, not just a guy getting all the girls for no reason. The relationships will be built. Anyway, until next time. Chapter 84. Chapter 81. Debate Udi Temple, Coruscant, Galactic City. POV. Within the High Council room, the Jedi High Council was in a heated debate. A trend that had been a daily occurrence ever since a few weeks ago on that day on Naboo, when Van and Qui-Gon had both willingly resigned from the Jedi Order. That event was the first event in a chain reaction, which began leading others within the Order to follow their path. First Obi-Wan on Naboo, then Plo Koon's own apprentice, Yanali Fonamis, who had revealed to the entire Order before she resigned that she was in intimate relationship with Van. Following that, the Council exiled Jedi Master Sifo Dias due to his actions in secretly creating a clone army for the Republic. Immediately after doing so, the Council faced the resignation of two more members, the promising knight Marcellus Antilles and the well-respected Jedi Master Dooku. But things didn't stop there. Just a few days ago, the Order had lost two more Jedi, the first being Sin Drolig's apprentice, Sarah Kido, while the second was the last of Dooku's apprentices, still a member of the Jedi Order, Kamari Vosa. All of these Jedi, with the exception of Sifo Dias, had willing left the Order, an event the Jedi had not faced since the end of the New Sith Wars close to a 1,000 years ago. Once more, the departures of these Jedi were causing massive internal strife within the Jedi Order, putting its members on opposite sides in regards to the reasons those Jedi chose to leave the Order. Hence why the High Council has been discussing the situation. They wanted to find a solution to what was a problem in their eyes before things escalated any further. We cannot allow this to go on any longer. I know you all have sensed the strife these recent departures have caused within the Order. To say nothing of the fact that all the Jedi who have left over this short amount of time, save former Master Qui-Gon, Padawan Kenobi, and Master Sifo Dias, removed their kyber crystals from their lightsabers before turning them over to us. Master Mundi spoke. We must do something and quickly. And what would you have us do, Master Mundi? Master Yaddle asked. A member's right to leave the Order is one of our oldest rules and traditions. If we go against that rule simply to suit our situation, then we would disgrace the Jedi Order itself. She spoke. Still something must be done. Master Teen spoke. Yes, Masters Teen and Mundi speak the truth. Master Peel added. For I think all of us in this room are aware of what usually happens when members begin leaving the ranks of the Order in large numbers. He said. Everyone in the High Council room perfectly understanding what Master Peel is saying. The Lannic Jedi Master was alluding to events like the Jedi Civil War and the several schisms throughout the Order's sordid history. Master Peel was saying they might be facing a modern-day version of such an event. The Lannic Jedi had no idea how close to the truth he was. We cannot be sure what you are suggesting will come to pass, Master Peel. So we must tread carefully, lest we ourselves cause even more members to leave our ranks due to our actions. Plo Koon spoke. T second that, Master Koth said. We cannot go after people simply because they have left the order. But it's not just that Master Koth and you know it, Master Peel spoke. I think there is cause to be worried, namely due to Van Sunrider. Yes. Do you remember the way he spoke back on Naboo? Master Teen asked. The armor, his words, his strength, and the way many of the younger generation of the order look up to him. Master Balaba spoke. If I didn't know any better, I would say we were looking at a modern-day Rivan, she mused, which caused a strange air to form within the High Council room. For just like with Master Peel earlier, Master Balaba didn't know how close to the truth she was. 
On another note, it was true what Master Balaba said, Van was looked up to by many of the younger members of the order. Mostly pedons and young, knights. But even a few senior knights and some masters respected him. For Van had all the qualities of a great leader, even if he himself hasn't fully realized it yet. Yes, I can see it. Master Teen spoke. The young Sunrider is starting to resemble Ravan. That is your opinion and nothing more, Master Teen. Plo Koon spoke. Do not think you can use it in justifying any harsh action against young Sunrider. Master Plo Koon, when did you become such a staunch protector of young Sunrider? Mundi asked. For after all, it was likely he who convinced your Padawan learner to break the code, or maybe former Padawan phonemies ended up like that due to poor teaching. The Syrian Jedi said, Say another word, Master Mundi, and I'll not restrain myself from taking action against you. Plo Koon spoke. Invisible lightning sparks coming from the two of them clashing. We must act before this desertion within the Order grows. Master Teen said, Those who wish have every right to leave the Order. Master Galia spoke. Then let us monitor the actions of those Jedi who have left our ranks in this short amount of time. Master Peel proposed. You would spy on them when they have done nothing wrong but simply challenge your personal values and beliefs. That is not the Jedi way. Master Koth retorted, thus words continued flying back and forth. The Jedi High Council itself having become divided due to recent events, just like the rest of the Jedi Order, sitting silently, watching as the High Council members argued amongst themselves, Master Yoda couldn't help but feel his age once again. A trend with the old Grand Master lately, Yoda also felt the current schism in the Order would grow no matter what. Now the question on his mind was what actions he needed to take to prevent the Jedi from fighting amongst themselves like had so many times in the past. It was a question Yoda knew he wouldn't have the answer to any time soon. But he would get the answer. For he would not allow the Jedi to fall. Because that was a duty he had imposed upon himself. One he would see through, no matter what. A.N. The schism continues. More will come. Stay tuned in. You must to learn more. Also, we've reached number one in the powers rankings. So thank you, my loyal supporters. Chapter 85, Chapter 82, Fall and Rise, Rule, Bulg Family Estate, Person, POV. A devilish grin on his face, Sidious sat in the Manning dining hall of the Bulk Estate, waiting for Sora Bulg to arrive. The man who Sidious would make his new apprentice, expendable pawn, and use to further his personal version of the Sith Grand Plan which was coming along better than Sidious could hope. First, he has succeeded in killing his master, Plagueis. Then he had succeeded in becoming Supreme Chancellor of the Republic. Next, there was the Clone Army. Honestly, Sidious was a bit surprised when his master informed him he was able to convince Sifo-Dyas to commission the Clone Army, but Sidious's surprise quickly turned to glee. For that fool Sifo-Dyas had helped further the end of the Jedi he was so desperately trying to protect. Pathetic fool, Sidious mused, though he never expected Cephodias to reveal the existence of the clone army to his fellow Jedi. But that matter was of no real consequence to Sidious. He would still use the clone army to achieve his own ends, and now he had easier access to the project given his identity as Palpatine. Yes, everything was coming together for the Sith Lord, the Jedi being none the wiser. Oh, and speaking of the Jedi, Sidious almost creamed his robes in utter delight when he heard about their recent fracturing. Sure, he didn't like the Jedi separating, but again, that was of no real consequence to him. Because for Sidious, all Jedi would die no matter what, except for one, Van Sunrider, the one Sidious would have as his apprentice. For back on Naboo, he sensed Van's strength, the power that boy excluded, mine, he shall be mine, Sidious thought, licking his lips. In that exact moment somewhere in the galaxy, Van felt a shiver run down his spine. He then used his hands to protect his butt, for he felt it was in danger. As Sidious thought of the future, he would create Sora Bulg arrived on his family estate. For yet another face-to-face -face meeting with the Sith he had encountered on the property all those months ago. Ever since that first meeting, Bulg had been in constant contact with the Sith. Despite the fact the weak way Jedi Master knowing it wrong, and that if his fellow members of the Order ever discovered his secret, then he would be struck down alongside the Sith. Yet Bull persisted in actions, 
Entering the main house, Bold quickly made his way to the main dining hall, finding Sidious waiting for him. Welcome, my friend. Sidious spoke to Bulg. Thank you for joining me here tonight. Toot was no problem, Bulk replied, taking a seat in one of the chairs. So, for what reason did you call me here tonight? To discuss the future, Sidious replied. The future of the galaxy. You refer to your plan to create a new order, Bulg stated. For over these past few months, Sidious and Bulg had discussed the idea at length. Yes, Sidious replied. I have decided to move forward with it, and I ask for your help in seeing it come to fruition. Hearing Sidious' words, Bulg became shocked. No, there must be another way, Bulg said. To put your plan into place would mean the loss of millions of lives and set the galaxy on fire. Yes, but it would be a small price to pay in order to make the galaxy a better place in the long run. Sidious spoke. Come, my friend. You see the truth of the galaxy just as much as I do. You know the corruption and rot that is festering within the Republic. You have seen their inadequacies firsthand. Look how they recently abandoned Naboo and its people. Look how the Republic let them starve. Look at how the Jedi Order you have served for most of your life sat back and watched as everything took place. You know I speak the truth. Come now, search your feelings. Bulk wanted to say something, anything in response to Sidious' words. But he found himself speechless. For Bulk knew Sidious was correct. The Republic and even the Jedi Order were failing the people of the galaxy, and that needed to change. To know you speak the truth, Bulk stated, which caused Sidious to smile. Even you know that then assist me, Sidious said. Come, let us do what others can or will not. Make the galaxy a safe and better place for all. Yes, Bulk replied. Good, Sidious said. He then stood up and walked over a Bulk, who got out of his chair and then kneeled down on his right knee in front of Sidious. For Bulg knew this is what he had to do in order to help Sidious achieve his new order, become his apprentice, which Sidious had explained to him some time ago. Do you swear yourself to me? Sidious asked. To do, my master, Bulg replied. Good, now rise my apprentice, Sidious said. From this moment on you will be known as Darth Rorn, the Sith Lord proclaimed. Yes, my master, Bulg replied. He then stood to his feet, his eyes glowing a soft yellow, for he had fully began to embrace the dark side of the Force, thus keeping the wheels of time turning and putting the galaxy close to the Clone Wars. A.N. Yes, yeah, Sidious still got his new apprentice, Jedi Master Sora Bulk, who is now also known as Darth Rorn. Though Sidious still has his major sights set on Van, stay tuned for more as Van protects his butt from Sidious. Chapter 86 Chapter 83 Jedi Order is Born Sector TDO System the chest containing the Noeticons in my hands, I walked towards the Milanos' conference room. Arriving outside the door, I inhaled and then exhaled to calm my nerves, for I was about to engage in one of the most important meetings thus far in regards to the future. Well then, let's do this, I muttered. I then entered the conference room, finding everyone waiting for me, everyone being HK-47 and the others who resigned from the Jedi Order shortly after I did, except for Sifo Dias who was exiled. But he is present. Komari is also present, for she too decided to leave the Order. I didn't need to ask her why. I know the reason, and I'm just glad she's here with us. The reason they are all here is because I called for them to assemble. Taking a seat in the open chair, I looked at everyone. Thanks for coming, I told them. So I know you have many questions for me, and today I will answer them, I explained. First off, the people you see around Exus Station are part of the Mercenary Squadron Dominicus. As for why they are here, we are currently using Exus Station as our main base of operations, I explained, since I knew everyone was wondering who they were. Wait, Van, you're a part of Dominicus? Komari asked me. Tam, not just a part of it. 1AM Dominicus's founder and leader, Moriarty, I revealed. Shocking everyone, except for HK-47. But then that robotic bastard has never been surprised as long as I've known him. You formed this mercenary band. Why? Dooku asked me. Because they are the first soldiers and allies for the new government I am in the POS of creating, I replied. Everyone getting shocked expressions on their face once more, though I didn't sense any outright disapproval of my idea from anyone. I'll take that as a good sign. Van, you mean to betray the Republic? Obi-Wan asked me. No. 
I mean to make the galaxy a safer place, something both the Republic and Jedi Order have failed to truly do for a very long time, I replied. And to accomplish this, I believe a new galactic power is necessary, one who will stand up for its citizens and protect them when they are in trouble, not discuss the matter while innocents are harmed. This new government of yours will be seen as treason by many, Qui-Gon told me. Yeah, by a bunch of hypocritical bastards, I snarled. The ones sitting at the top who would abandon a republic world to the Trade Federation would be upset that certain worlds no longer want to be a part of their bullshit system and government and would rather try to build something new, which they every right to do the last time I checked. Do this and there might be war, Sifo Dias replied. Why? It's not like Republic member states can't withdraw if they so choose. And if they happen to join the new government once it is established, then the Republic better not say shit about it, for it will likely be them who initiates a war, and should it come to pass, it will show just how selfish and petty the Republic truly is. I spoke. TC, you've thought this through, Dooku mused. Of course I have, Master. I have even already come up with the name for the new government, the Galactic Systems Alliance, or GSA for short. I spoke. Nice. It rolls off the tongue. Kumari spoke. Thanks, Kumari. Also, did you get what I asked for? Yep, sure did. Kumari replied. She then reached into her pocket and handed me a data chip, which contained a complete copy of all records from the Jedi Temple archives. From the historical texts to the star maps to even the records regarding lightsaber construction and lightsaber combat forms, Thad asked Kamari to acquire it for me a while ago, since I couldn't do it myself any longer, given my resignation from the Order. Why did I do this? Because even with all the changes I've made, there is no guarantee Order 66 won't come pass, and should it still happen, the information Kamari just handed to me will be invaluable in keeping the knowledge and ways of the Force employed by the Jedi alive. I wish I could have asked Kamari to also acquire some holocrons from the temple as well, but that would have been too risky. For the Order watches those like hawks, and if some went missing, they would be all over us. So holocron equestion will have to wait. We'll just make do with everyone's own knowledge and the noeticons for now. Speaking of them, opening the chest that contained the noeticons, I showed them to everybody, which once again shocked them. Van, are those what I think they are? Yanali asked me. Yes, they are noeticons, and not just any noeticons, but the noeticons of light, science, and secrets that were lost centuries ago during the Great Galactic War, I revealed. They are how I have grown more powerful over this short period of time, I explained, since everyone has been asking me how I did so, and I've been avoiding the topic, but now the time for avoidance is over. No, it's truth time. How did you acquire these? Sifodias asked me. They were left here for me on Exus Station by an ancestor of mine, whom Nomi herself instructed to find these noeticons and store them here for me. I explained. So this is the gift Grandmaster Sunrider left you for help combat the coming darkness. Dooku spoke. Yes, I replied. Damn Van, what else have you been hiding? Marcellus asked me in pure curiosity. Well, I found the lost Katana fleet of the Republic and plan to use those ships as the first fleet in the GSA military. Oh, and I am planning to start my own version of the Jedi Order, which I wish all of you to become a part of. Then, for those of you who don't know, there is HK-47 Origins. I spoke. What? How do the origins of your droid compare to anything else you've just revealed to us? Obi-Wan asked me. Oh, how he's about to choke on those words. Statement. Attention Jedi meatbags, I have not been formally introduced to yet Tam, the assassin droid HK-47, the greatest assassin droid in history, my creator being the one you meatbags call Ravan. HK-47 spoke, which sent the entire room into a dead silence, Kamari breaking it after a minute. Bantha Dung. I call Bantha Dung on your droid's origins, Van, because that would mean this droid is millennia old. Kamari spoke. T no, but his origins are not a lie. Would you like HK to show you images from his memory bank as proof? I asked. Commentary. Master, I do not think your suggestion would be optimal to employee at this moment. For most of the oldest images I can currently access from my memory banks are of me slaughtering Jedi and Sith meatbags, which might cause your allies to attack me, thus forcing me to kill them in self-defense. 
a course of action I do not wish to take at this time, for I fear it might alienate you from me, and I do not want that situation to occur, for then I would not be able to engage in the glorious slaughter of meatbags that you allow me to do. HK-47 spoke, his eyes glowing with intensity. As usual, HK, you have a way with words, I replied. Statement, it is all a part of my programming master, HK-47 replied. Hey, is this droid always like this? Komari asked. Yep, he is, Marcellus replied, and he'll never change, since Rev and for whatever reasons he had programmed him to be like he is. I added. Right, Komari mused. Well, moving on from that for the moment, young Sunrider, you said you mean to establish your own version of the Jedi Order? Sifo-Dyas asked me. I nodded my head. Yes, I seek to establish my own version of the Jedi Order, the one that existed before the horrible Rusen Reformations, where Jedi wore armor into battle, could hold military positions, could be involved in politics, but most importantly could form attachments and have families. I know it will not be easy. But since it looks like the current Order will not see the mistakes they are making, then this is the path I must walk, and I ask all of you to walk it with me. I spoke passionately even when seeking the balance between the dark and light. What, you mean to delve into the dark side of the Force? Qui-Gon shouted. t do, I replied. Van, that's crazy, Sarah said. I'm all for changing some rules, but not that one. Why would you even consider doing something like that? For it is the first step we must take toward reunification and ending this never-ending cycle of war between Jedi and Sith, I began. Ever since the first great schism ages ago on Tython, it's been light against dark, the Jedi against the Sith, in a never-ending circle that has only served to cause nothing but death and destruction. The Great Hyperspace War, the Great Galactic War, the Old and New Sith Wars, time and time again, the light and dark clash, but neither ever truly wins, because both sides choose not to acknowledge one simple fact. And what is that young Sunrider? Sifo Dias asked. That light nor dark can exist without the other, I said. Be that as it may, the dark side is dangerous. Sifo Dias spoke. Oh, believe me, I know, I replied. But just because the dark side is dangerous does not mean it's impossible to control and use. If that were the case, then Lightsaber Form 7 would have been outright banned instead of just restricted by the Jedi Order, and Master Windu would have never been allowed to create the Vapad variation of the form. I explained, no one able to reroute my words. To see the points you are making, and they are very good ones, my former apprentice, but do you really think the balance you seek can be achieved in our lifetimes? Dooku spoke. No, it most definitely will not be. I said, but I do hope one day far in the future our successors can achieve the balance I'm talking about, I explained. So I ask you all once more, will you walk this path with me? Will you take a chance on something new? Having said my piece, I waited for them to respond, the first one to do so being Marcellus. T will stand with you, my friend. Marcellus spoke. Me too. Yanali added, T will as well. Sarah said, then the others agreed as well, filling my heart with immense joy, for they have just become the first members of the Jedi Order, which I know will be a great success. A.N. Yeah, so a lot of Van coming clean in this chapter. Also, his own version of the Jedi Order has finally been established, which I chose to call the Jedi Order in honor of the ancient Jedi warriors of Tython, for Van's Jedi Order will use the dark side and seek balance. Until next chapter, my readers. Chapter 87, A Galaxy in Turmoil. A.N. Okay, readers, time for a short time skip, which will lead to a lot of new developments. Hope you enjoy it. Chancellor's Suite. Ceremonial Office, Republic Executive Building, Coruscant, Galactic City, 31. Reading the information on a data pad in his hands, one of many littering his desk, Sidious resisted the urge to growl or unleash his dark side powers. For the information he was reading on the data pad was basically the same thing he had been seeing for the better part of a year. An official request for a planet to withdraw their membership from the Galactic Republic one of many he had been receiving lately. Just thinking about the withdrawal requests he had been getting made Palpatine growl in anger, namely because the official withdrawal requests were not a part of his own plans and were slowly ruining them, among other things. First, 
there was the fact that a few months after he took office, the crimes of some of his greatest supporters and their allies within the Senate had been exposed bare to the entire galaxy. The excessive spending and under-the-table dealings of Orn Frita from Ryloth and Toonbuck Tora of Cy Merthian. The slaving ring Senator Tikkis from Dak and Senators Bufus Ritsomas, Danry Ledwello, and Wuja Wojain were a part of in the Outer Rim territories, to name a few. Naturally, the senators in question, with some assistance from Palpatine and his people, tried to avoid any trouble and keep their positions. But none of them did. Due in part to the fact the people of the Republic were constantly being reminded of the crimes of these select senators through various means, which outraged them. So seeing the writing on the wall, Palpatine threw a lot of his supporters to the wolves, losing much support and pawns he could manipulate within the Galactic Senate. Second, the existence of the clone army being prepared for the Republic on Kamino had been leaked to the entire galaxy, which in turn generated massive anger towards the Republic government from their judicial forces and other military personnel. To say nothing of the activist groups who were now taking an interest in the clones and their legal rights. Third, and finally, was the thing that grated on Palpatine's nerves the most. He had no idea how, or who, but someone started publishing the history of the galaxy that included the involvement of the Sith and their numerous empires. Along with a few other moments that had been redacted from general history of the galaxy over the past 1,000 years. They had been doing so by publishing a series of novella, which altogether is known as The Galactic Truth. The author of the novella series being known, simply as Elusive Man. Apperson Palpatine wanted to make beg for death more than he had anyone else in his entire life, for those novella were slowly causing the people in the galaxy at large to ask questions about the true history of the galaxy, questions Palpatine did not want asked. But no matter how much control he exerted over the media, the novella series would not disappear. It just kept popping up again and again, making Palpatine hate its author more and more, each and every time. The Sith Lord, knowing in his bones that the individual who called themselves Elusive Man was the same one who exposed the crimes of his allies within the Galactic Senate, and also revealed the existence for the clone army of Kamino to the galaxy at large. Palpatine knew this person was his enemy, yet no matter how hard he looked for them, he couldn't locate the person that was out to destroy him. It was so infuriating, Palpatine wanted to rage, but he didn't. No, he restrained himself. For although several disruptions had been thrown into his master plan, the general direction of it was still on track. Despite all the interests from activist groups and the anger of the Judicial Forces personnel, the Clone Army project was still on track, and production had not been halted. Then there was Palpatine's current apri, Nentis Sorabulg, or as he is known by his Sith name, Darth Rorn. His training was progressing smoothly, and the Jedi were still none the wiser. One of the greatest and most well-respected masters of the current generation was now Sith. Speaking of the Jedi, Palpatine had wondered if they might be the mysterious enemy who had been disrupting his plans but he quickly dismissed that idea. For Palpatine knew the Jedi well enough to know they would never act in such a covert manner, at least not the current era of Jedi. Besides, the Jedi Order has had its hands full recently. Deciding to stop thinking about his troubles over the past year, lest he murder the next person who spoke to him, Palpatine returned to his work, reviewing the official request for a planet to leave the Republic. A trend that had been happening lately given all the corruption and secrets that had been perpetrated by the Republic government and the people who ran it, being exposed in the light of day. It showed people how far the Republic had truly fallen, which was exactly the plan of the unknown elusive man when they began exposing the secrets and the corruption in the first place. Yes, everything was going according to their plans. Weighty Temple, Coruscant, Galactic City. Opening his eyes, Yoda ceased his meditation. The act doing little to settle the unrest happening within the age-old Jedi Grand Master. For in this past year, the schism within the Jedi Order had gone from bad to worse. Especially given the exposure of the corrupt practices of several senators, the existence of the clone army of Kamino being revealed to the galaxy at large, 
but worst of all was the fact the true history of the galaxy, which included the Sith and their various empires, was being exposed, and that fact the Jedi had a hand in removing said history from the general historical records of the galaxy over the past few hundred years. This caused the general populace to start inquiring into the Jedi more and more, and demanding answers for their actions pertaining to their manipulation of the galactic historic records. The same demands even came from some members of the Jedi Order itself, putting the High Council even more at odds with each other than it already was. For the Jedi High Council itself was now divided. One group, which were the traditionalists, were led by Master Kiadi Mundi, while the other group, those open to change, were led by Master Plo Kloon. Yoda tried his best to keep things from getting any worse, but he sometimes worried his efforts were futile, especially since several more Jedi had resigned from the Order in the past year. Jedi Masters Tholm and Tra Sa, who revealed before leaving the Order they had been in an intimate relationship in secret for years. Tholm's former apprentice and Jedi Knight Quinlan Vos and his apprentice Ayla Secura, Master Rannik Salusar and his apprentice Kento Marek. Jedi Master Klirara and Jedi Knight Garen Malm, Padawan Sialan Wes. All those Jedi had left the Order, and Yoda felt through the Force that in the near future more would follow. Walking over to the window of his room, Yoda looked out it toward the sunset, wondering exactly what the future held in store for the path of the Jedi and the Jedi Order. Chapter 88 Chapter 85 Recruitment Drive Episode 1 Calamari Sector Calamari System Third Person POV. Exiting hyperspace, a single ship entered the Kalamri system, the first ship of its class in fact which is known as the Bulwark class, the ship itself being named Bulwark. After exiting hyperspace, the Bulwark continued onward towards its destination, the planet Dak. Insert image of the planet Dak, Kalamari system, Dak. Descending through the atmosphere of Dak the Bulwark, headed for one of the many landing pads of Kipiru one of the many cities dotting the oceanic surface of Dak. After the ship landed, its ramping lowered. Then once it did, several individuals disembarked from the ship. The individuals in question being soldiers from Dominicus Duku and finally the designer of the Bulwark-class vessels, Arisha Cardis, who just a few months ago became employed by Dominicus. A job change she needed after her mentor and boss, Walex Blissex, left Kuat Drive Yards to work for Rendili Star Drive. After this happened, she contacted her friend Van, a thing she regularly did ever since they met on Corellia those few years ago, and explained the situation to him. Then one thing led to another, and now here, Arisha is. A bright smile on her face, Arisha looked upward, her gaze focused on the Mon Calamari shipyards above. One of the few shipyards in the Outer Rim territories that is said to be able to rival the ancient Core World shipyards of Kuat Rendili and Corellia. Arisha thought they were beautiful. Arisha, don't run off. Nilali Sudkor spoke, coming off the bulwark behind everyone else, for she too is now a member of Dominicus, having chosen to follow Arisha when she left Kuat Drive Yards, because Nilali see Arisha as a daughter, and vice versa, Arisha sees Nilali as a mother. Though you would never hear nor get either of them to admit that. Tim fine, leave me alone, Arisha replied. She then ran ahead of everyone, Nilali chasing after her and chastising her for her behavior as she did so, Duku and the rest from Dominicus ignoring the pair, for they had seen their antics many times before. It was a common occurrence. Moving on. Leaving Nilali and Arisha to themselves, Duku proceeded forward along with the Dominicus soldiers. As they did so, Duku couldn't help but think of all that had happened this past year. He had left the Jedi Order, become a founding member of the Jedi Order, had taken his birthright as the Count of Sereno, recounted fully with his sister Genza, was working to build a new government, and had begun learning the ways of the dark side of the Force in full to help reunify the Jedi and Sith back into one. To put simply, Dooku realized how busy he had been, and he didn't hate it. No, rather, he enjoyed all that he was doing. Just thinking about it brought a soft smile to the Jedi Master's face. Asmile, which he quickly dropped when he and the Dominicus soldiers came face to face with members of the Mon Calamari Royal Guard, which was being led by their recently promoted captain, one Giel Akbar, a Mon with the potential to become one of the greatest military tactician in galactic history. 
Insert image of GL Akbar here. Count Duku, I presume? Akbar asked Duku. You presume correctly, Duku replied. It seems you have me at a disadvantage. You know my name, but I do not know yours. To his guile, Akbar, Akbar spoke. Captain of the Mon Calamari Royal Guard, TC. Very good to meet you then, Captain Akbar, Duku spoke. Yes, Akbar replied. Well then, if you and your compatriots will follow me, then I will escort you to your destination. He said, Bar. The two groups then started walking together. Soon, they arrived at transports, which then ferried them for a large tower in the middle of Ki Piru. It was the headquarters of Mon Calamari shipyards in the city. Getting out of the transports, Duku and Akbar's group headed inside. Once they did, Duku left Arisha, Nalali, and most of the Dominicus soldiers behind, save for two, and began follow in Captain Akbar and his fellow guardsmen. Reaching a turbo lift, the group took it to the highest floor of the tower, after which Duku and the two Dominicus soldiers were led by the Mon Kala to a conference room. Arriving outside, Akbar pushed open the conference room doors. Thank you, Captain, Duku spoke. He then headed inside alone. After Duku did, the conference doors were closed. Taking its seat at the round conference table, Duku had his complete attention focused on the only two other individuals in the room. The current chieftain of the Korin, Nasori, insert image of Nasori here, and the king of the Mon Calamari, Yos Kalina. Two of the most important and powerful men on Mon Calamari. Greetings, King Kalina and Chieftain Rai. Duku spoke. Greetings, Count Duku, Rai replied. Yes, greetings to you. King Kalina added. So, Count, do you mind telling us why you requested this meeting? The Mon Kala king asked. Because getting an audience with a planetary leader was not easy. But given Duku's stellar reputation, his renouncement of the Jedi Order who were in deep trouble at the moment, and his new status as the Count of Sereno, and Duku managed to get a meeting. Yes. But first I wish to compliment your shipyards on the expert work they did in crafting the bulwark. The ship is most impressive. Duku spoke. Since his group had commissioned the Mon Calamari shipyards to make the bulwark a reality. We appreciate that count. Re spoke up. But as the king asked, please tell us why you called this meeting. Of course, Duku said. He then took a mini hollow projector out of his pocket and placed in the table. Duku then activated, and a second after he did a hologram of the Katana fleet appeared. Seeing the ships both King Kalina and Chieftain Re were at a loss for words, because both knew exactly what those ships were and their sordid past. Is this real? Rai asked. Oh, I assure you, gentlemen, it is very real. My allies and I managed to uncover the location of the lost Katana fleet, and I would like Moncala shipyards to repair and retrofit the fleet. Duku spoke. To what end? King Valina asked, so that we may employ it as the first fleet in the military that will serve our new government. Duku explained. Which is another reason I requested this meeting with both of you. I wish for Dad and the Mon Calamari sector to join our new government. He revealed. Stunning both Nasori and Yos Kalina though they recovered after a few seconds. A new government, you say? Is not forming one dangerous? What of the Republic? Rai asked. They have no say in the matter, for my allies and I will not be forming our government within their space or their borders, nor will be aggressive towards them, unless they are aggressive towards us. Duku spoke. Besides my leaders, if you thought so highly of the Republic, then Dak would be not officially withdrawn from it after the incident involving Senator Tikkis. A fact neither King Kalina nor Chieftain Rai could deny. Upon learning how Tikkis was selling out the people of Dak, both Corrine and Mon Calamari, the two leaders could not believe what they heard. But then, as more and more evidence of Tikkis crimes came to light, they both found they couldn't deny the truth any longer, which made them want juices. Yet the Republic refused to give them any. Even with Tikkis' crimes exposed, the Republic did not immediately act. No, they dragged their heels while simply placing Tikkis on house arrest. Finally, Re, Kalina, and both their peoples could not wait for the Republic to dispense justice any longer. So they took matters into their own hands. The two leaders fully withdrew Dak from the Republic and then executed Tikkis and many of his supporters who had helped him in his crimes shortly thereafter. A decision that actually brought the Corrine and Moncala even closer. What you say is true, Count Duku, 
But tell me, why should we join your government if we just withdrew from one? And how will yours be any different from the Republic? Not to mention, what will happen to us should we refuse your offer? King Kalina spoke. All very reasonable and valid questions, King Kalina. Ones I will answer. Dooku replied. He then did just that. Dooku answered any questions Ryan Kalina had pertaining to the new government he and his allies were in the process of creating. So, what say you both? Dooku asked. Having finished answering all of Ryan Kalina's questions, it sounds intriguing, truly. Ree spoke. But this decision is not ours alone to make. Yes, we must consult with our advisors before making any final decisions in regards to your proposal, King Kalina said. To understand, Dooku replied. Now then about the Katana fleet, can you at least accept that offer? Tam sorry to say we cannot, King Kalina said. Tough the Republic were to learn what we were doing for you it might cause trouble for Dak. That is why until we make an official decision regarding your proposal to join your new government, we cannot perform any work on the Katana fleet. Re explained. Very well, Dooku replied making a note to inform everyone later that Day would not refit and repair the Katana fleet, meaning they might have to turn to one of their backup shipyard choices to get the Katana fleet repaired, which were Bodajef and Fondor. T in that case, if you will not work on the Katana fleet, then I would like to commission the Mon Calamari shipyards to build us more Bulwark-class ships. Dooku spoke. Yes, we can do that, Kalina said. Most certainly, Rai added. Excellent, Dooku replied. And in addition to more Bulwark-class ships, I would like to commission the shipyards of Dak to build two more new ship classes and ships of their line, he said. Dooku then took out a hollow projector and activated it, displaying the holographic details of two new ships created by none other than Van. The first ship was what Van called an Orion-class assault carrier, while the second ship is known as a Charon-class light frigate. Both ship designs were impressive in Dooku's eyes. It was yet another reason he was proud to call Van a student of his. Looking at the two ship designs Dooku was showing them, King Kalina and Chieftain Ri had no issues agreeing to produce them, as well as more Bulwark-class ships, meaning Dooku still accomplished a goal, even if it was not the one he set out to do. Chapter 89 Chapter 86 Recruitment Drive Episode 2 Anoat Sector Besoin Sector Bespin, third Persvi. Their shuttle having completed its landing, Komari Vosa and Sialan Wes disembarked from it. The two blondes, one of the first master apprentice pair of the Jedi Order. Having admired Van and his friends, since she was only a year younger than them, Sialan decided to take a chance and leave the Order like they did, then contact them to see what they were planning. For the Force told Sialan they were, and it was something she never expected. The creation of a new Jedi Order, one which would teach its members to wield both the light and dark side of the Force. At first, Sialan thought Van and his friends were crazy, but after seeing the likes of Jedi like the famous Dooku and Master Sifo Dias going along with the idea, Sialan decided to give it a try, finding herself in an entirely new world after she did. So she decided to become a member of the Jedi Order, and in the process started getting along well with Komari the two having similar personalities. As such, since Sialan's training was nowhere near finished, Komari decided to become her master. Now here they are. Turning their gazes ahead, Komari and Sialan spotted the man they were here to see waiting for them. Jin Altis, Jedi Master and founder of the Altesian Jedi, a sect of Jedi who believed in having attachments and families while still being able to use the Force and be Jedi. Taking in the two female Jedi in front of him, Jin wondered what this was all about. Since although he was longer a member of the main order due to philosophical differences, it doesn't mean he still didn't have friends who were. Friends who had informed Jin of a growing schism within the main Jedi order which had started in the last year. With the resignation of a young Jedi known as Van Sunrider, then after he left the order more followed in his wake, including his lover from what Jin had heard. When he did, he wanted to meet Van and discuss a few things, but Jin couldn't locate him. Then all of a sudden, just last week, Van has contacted Jin, informing the Jedi Master of a proposal he had for him, which would be delivered to Jin by two of his allies. That is what is happening right now. 
walking up to Master Jin Sialan and Kamari gave a slight bow to the man before raising their heads. Hello, Master Altus. A pleasure to meet you. Kamari spoke. I am Master Kamari Vosa, and this is my apprentice Sialin Wes, she spoke. Master, Sialan said to Jin. Nice to meet you both, he replied. But forgive me, I'm a bit confused. You are Van Sunrider's allies, correct? We are, Kamari replied. And from the information I have, both he and you two have left the order. Jin spoke. That is correct, Sialin answered. Then why do you two call yourself master and apprentice? Jin asked. This caused both women to smile. That is the very reason we came to speak with you, Master Jin, Kamari said, intriguing Jin more and more about what Van had sent them here for discuss with him. Well, he is about to find out. Inside the living room of his home, Jin was utterly speechless at what Lomari and Sialan had just told him, that the Jedi who had recently left the Order had formed their own version of if known as the Jedi Order, which Bu PMD employ the traditions of Jedi past, such as the reintroduction of Jedi battle armor. The Jedi Order would also teach its students to wield both the light and dark side of the Force. After processing this, Jin ran a hand through his white hair. I see, he mused. So, what exactly do you all want from me? We would like you to join us, Kamari said. We would like the Atlas and Jedi sect to become part of the Jedi Order. And if I say no, will you kill me and my students? Jin asked. No, we won't. But I understand how you think that might happen, considering we Jedi touch upon the dark side. But believe me, it's not as bad as you're probably imagining. Kamari spoke. He dark side is dangerous, but it can be tamed. Ceylon said. In fact, my master and I have both touched upon the dark side, Ceylon revealed. But do we seem like stark, raving lunatics who get drunk on power and would stab their allies in the back just to fulfill some seated need to fell superior to others simply because we can't face our own issues or shortcomings? No, Jin replied. Still, this a big a decision. And say my people and I did join you, what would we have to do? Nothing much, Kamari replied. Simply join our order, come to train with the rest of us from time to time, and please take care to note any Force-sensitive you come across, no matter their age, and inform us of them, even if they have family. She explained. Really, that's it? Jin asked. Yes, Kamari replied. We're not the main order, Master Jin. We don't intend to keep the members of the Jedi Order cooped up in some stuffy temple on one planet. One of our order's goals is to bring back the Jedi ways of old which involved having many enclaves spread throughout the galaxy to teach our ways. That's really all we're asking from you. TC, Jin said. He then thought about things for a moment before speaking again. Am, I changed my mind. Me and my people would be happy to be called a part of your Jedi Order. Jin spoke. For after reconsidering for a moment, he realized joining Van and the others was a good idea. So they could have someone to turn to in times of trouble among other reasons. Wonderful Master Jin, Kamari spoke. Thank you, I promise you won't regret making this decision. T truly hope I don't. Jin riolied. He and Kamari then shook hands, officially bringing the Altisian Jedi sect into the Jedi Order. Chapter 90, Chapter 87, Recruitment Drive Part 3, Oral Sector, Adega System, Asus. Sitting on the ruined steps of the ancient Great Jedi Library, Kento still couldn't believe he was. He was at a place that was talked about in the history books, a place that was one of the greatest monuments to the Jedi Order ever known. Yet here Kento was, just sitting on on the steps of said place. It amazes him, but what amazed him more is how he ended up at the Great Jedi Library. He, his former master Rannick, since those of the Jedi Order had saw fit to make Kento one of their first knights, and his master agreed, and Qui-Gon Jinn had been asked by Van to search Asus for any ancient Force-related artifacts, which would be used to help build the Jedi Order. Since compared to the Jedi Order, they were lacking in a lot of things. Members, resources, and Jedi artifacts such as holocrons. So with that in their minds, Kento, Rannick, and Qui-Gon agreed to take on the mission and soon after headed for Asus. Arriving at the planet, and then managing to land on it, despite its violent weather conditions, the three Jedi began their search of the planet. A week after they did so, the three of them stumbled upon something unbelievable. People. There were people living on Asus. 
which all three Jedi knew, should have been impossible. Given they knew the history of Asus and how it was hit by a supernova that made it uninhabitable for millennia, no people should have been able to live, let alone survive on the planet. Yet Kento and the others could not deny what was in front of them, living, breathing people, who immediately attacked the trio upon meeting them, using the Force as they did. Another shock to Kento, Rannick, and Qui-Gon. Yet, that shocking revelation didn't stop the three from defending themselves against the Asus natives. Then after they did so for a while, the Asus natives stopped attacking Kento and the others, and then started bowing to them and worshipping them, confusing Kento to his very core. But in time, thanks in a large part to Qui-Gon getting friendly with the Asus natives quickly, the young Jedi Knight understood the actions of the Asus natives. Apparently, they called themselves the Yisana, and from what Qui-Gon was able to determine, they were descendants of people who had lived on Asus for a long time. Learning this, the three Jedi deduced the Isana were descendants of Jedi and others who couldn't make it off Asus in the past before the supernova hit it. Upon learning this, Kento became truly amazed at how the Isana and their ancestors managed to survive alone on Asus for all that time, enduring the harsh conditions of the planet. Yet that was not the biggest surprise Kento would encounter on Asus. No, that came later in the form of the ancient Neti Jedi Master, Udnar. Kento, Rannick, and Qui-Gon encountered him shortly after they became friendly with the Isana. When the tribe took them to what they referred to as their Place of Ascension, which was an ancient tree, the three Jedi instantly sensed it was incredibly strong with the Force. So they tried connecting with it. Shortly after they did so, the ancient tree went through a stunning transformation, and soon Kento and his group came face to face with Udbnar, who, once the Neti Jedi revealed his identity to the group, almost made them all pass out, for they couldn't believe they were actually taking to Udnar, an ancient and respected Jedi they had all learned about during their studies as members of the Jedi Order. A Jedi who was friends with the founder of the Great Jedi Library, Master Odin Ur. A Jedi who lived during the time of the Great Sith War, and actually interacted with legendary Jedi figures such as Ulic Keldroma, Nomi Sunrider, and one of the greatest fallen Jedi in the history of the galaxy, Exar Kun. That was the Jedi Kento's group encountered, no matter how much they themselves couldn't believe it so. Moving on. After Kento and his group got over, air shock of meeting Udbnar and calming down the Asana, given their sacred place, grew legs and started speaking they started conversing with the ancient Neti Jedi Master, informing him of the history of the galaxy since his slumber. From the battles and wars fought to the state of the Jedi Order, Kento, Ronik, and Qui-Gon Jinn held nothing back, including that they left the Jedi Order and were some of the founding members of the Jedi Order, which Udnar decided to join after Kento and his group finished catching him up on events that had happened since he entered his deep slumber. Hearing Udnar's suddenly declaration confused Kento's group. But after Udnar explained to them he would never join the travesties the Galactic Republic and Jedi Order had become, and how he agreed with the Jedi Order idea of reunification between the light and dark sides of the Force, the group didn't question the Neti Jedi Master anymore. They simply accepted him into the ranks of the Jedi Order. Once they did so, they covertly informed Van and the others of what they found on Asus, which also included an ancient cache of lightsabers Master Benar had been protecting during his long slumber, as well as the runes of the Great Jedi Library, which Benar himself led the group to, which still held some ancient records and texts, even after the long millennia of neglect. A neglect that would occur no longer. For after Van learned of the events of Asus from Kento's group, he declared, and everyone else agreed, to make Asus the first official base and praxeum of the Jedi Order. Everyone also agreed to keep the fact Master Bnar was alive a close guarded secret, partly because they didn't want the Jedi Order learning of their discoveries and trying to claim them for themselves, and partly because none of them, save Van of course, knew where the Sith currently roaming the galaxy were and the Jedi Order did not want to advertise the location of their new base Praxium, lest they fall under attack from the Sith still at large. 
Thus, that is how Kento ended up in his current position. A month has passed since the discovery on Asus took place, and during that time, the Jedi Order and their allies have begun reconstructing the Great Jedi Library and preparing defenses for Asus. The Jedi and their allies have also started teaching the Sana tribe about the galaxy at large, and some have even started training to become members of the Jedi Order. Looking out ahead of him, Kento saw Qui-Gon instructing a group of younglings, all of them from the Isana tribe, save for Anakin Skywalker, in Form 1, Shi Cho. He couldn't help but crack a small smile upon seeing this and recalling his own childhood doing the same thing. Tino that look. An old and weathered voice spoke behind Kento. Remembering a good time? Yes, I am Master Bnar, Kento replied, turning to face Udnar after he did. Good, good, Nar mused. It's always good to recall nice memories when you can, that way the bad ones won't overwhelm you. He spoke. So keep that in mind, Master, Kento said. Yes, please do. Benar said. So I need some assistance organizing something in the library, and I was wondering if you might help me? Sure, no problem, Kento replied. He then got up and headed into the Great Jedi Library with Master Benar, the library that would in the future become known as the Great Jedi Library. A.N. Yep, the ancient Jedi Adnar is here, my readers. Talways felt it was wrong how he didn't survive to teach Luke and his new Jedi Order all he knew in the EU legends. Talso wonder why the Jedi who managed to survive the Imperial Era didn't join Luke's new Jedi Order in the EU legends. But it's whatever. Anyway, the Jedi Order is slowly building itself up. Stay tuned for the next chapter.